isn't he? John Knights does lighting and goodness knows what, yeah. Yeah, I knew I recognised the name. Yeah, one yeah, there, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so do you run a firm or anything like that? No. Right, okay. Just a DIY. All right. Did he speak last year? I did. As you and your yeah, good lady, did yeah. Excellent talk last year. Um, did I? Yeah. Um, oh, no pressure. Just said last year was excellent. <laughs> You've got a massive um, uh, truck which has got some scramble bikes. Yeah, brilliant. Okay. All right. Yeah, it's for sale. Brilliant. Sorry, how much is it going for? Sorry. How much is your truck going for? Uh, somewhere around the ten, twelve grand mark. Okay. Uh, I might have sold it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. happy. Okay. So, so, so we'll push on now then, uh, ladies and gents, uh, it's John Knight, who is going to talk <laughs> about... It's not He's John Knight. Up, I'm just introducing, don't worry. Um, he'll be talking about expedition trucks, whether to buy one or build one, and I will leave it with you then, John. All right, All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. Good afternoon, all. Um, don't know why you're inside when it's sunny outside, so we'll keep this as short as possible, shall we? Um, we're probably all here for the same reason that we want to build a truck or we want to convert a van. So where do we start? Are you daunted by all the vehicles? Soak down the pub about it and somebody goes, whoo, you can't do that, you know, it's too hard, this, that and the other. Well, the organiser of this event told me that he did the same. I think you've all seen him driving around in his orange Range Rover. Well, I'm going to tell you a little story now. He did have a white Range Rover before, and he sold that because he couldn't be bothered to convert it. He didn't know where to start. So, if there's any more of you like Tom, poor old Tom, this might just start the ball rolling and you might actually get round to doing your own. You don't have to be a super person to be able to do that. I'm closer to Clark Kent than Superman, and I'm nowhere near joining that organisation, if you know what that organisation's logo is. That logo is for Mensa. I'm not eligible for Mensa, but I've done my own. So let's start at the beginning. There's a whole range of base vehicles out there which you could use. Which one you use for you, choice. If you want to pick the one in the bottom right hand corner, that's fine, if that fits you. If you want the one in the middle on the old Transit CI motorhome, that's fine if that's the one which suits you. And anything else in between. The vehicle is yours. It's not mine, it's nobody else's. What's right for me may not be right for you. Hopefully it will be right for somebody today because mine's up for sale. But actually, if it's right for more than one person, even better because then we can enter into a bidding war, can't we? So. How many different base vehicles have you got? As many as you want, really. But I'm going to stick to vehicles which have got a track. So you've got 4 b 2s 4B4s, 4B2s can be anything from a hatchback through to a blank screen. <laughs> have we got the screen coming back? Oh, right, OK. So, 4B2 can be anything of a hatchback or an estate car, and people have done it in those. Right the way through to your small 4B4s. He's doing a sterling job here. Your 4B4s, which are your Land Rover type size vehicles. Your bigger 4B4s, which I think there's one on the entrance. The Typical VW LT, about five tonner. There's one on the entrance to the show area. And then your bigger 4B4s, well, there's quite a few of them there. Mainly ex-military vehicles, and the choice is yours. What will determine what vehicle you get? The next spot, living space. Do you want to go for a van conversion or a purpose-built body? If you're going for a van conversion, you're probably going to be running on a 4B2. Although there are some 4x4 panel vans out there, sprinters, etc. Self-build, that's what this is all about. To go through the self-build, if you want to go down the route of the self-build, you've got to really decide on all the next bits. Size, build or buy, 
torsion-free mount, interior layout, electrical supply, water system, heating and ventilation, toilet and shower, other bits such as roof, hatch, access, storage, security, tools and facilities. That's what we're going to talk about this afternoon. Because there's a lot there, and if you're just stood on a showroom court forecourt or something, or stood next to one of them, which has got a for sale sign in the windscreen, and thinking, what do I want? You're going to have to make a snap decision there and then. You don't want to do a snap decision there and then. So, as I said before, personal choice, up to you, whether you go for 4x4s, 4x2s or whatever. It's up to you whether you go for a panel conversion. They all have advantages and they all have disadvantages, like everything in life. But don't discount a 4x2. So we'll look at the cheapest, easiest option first. It's one, as we all know, it's one with four wheels where two are driven. A lot are now front wheel drive. Ducatos, etc., etc. Even Transit's come front wheel drive now. That means that your front wheels are doing three things the steering gear, the driving gear, and the carrying out most of the braking forces. The back wheels, well, they're just stopping the back from sort of hanging up, dragging along the floor, really. They don't do a great deal. Do you want to put all those tyres and wheels and bearings under all that stress? You can do. People have done the silk route with all that stress on them. But you might want to think more about sharing the, the work between front and rear axles. Did you see everything there with, with me? Yep. I've never come across yet a back axle that has been broken by somebody driving with relative care. I've come across them being broken by people who have been absolute plonks. But that's a different thing. You can break anything if you want to. So rear wheel drive setup will probably be stronger, tougher, last a bit longer. Because you have no movement in the back axle. It's usually what they call a live back axle. Your driving parts are in that massive great big casing. They're all protected. Whereas on the front, your drive shafts are exposed and carried on. You probably have one centre bearing on the back of the engine and you've got four CV joints. You don't have CV joints on the front axle of a 4x4 truck. You have something similar, but they're much more solid. That's my personal view. Some people might be happy with a 4x2 front axle. Oh, right, the, the bottom bit, that's quite useful, actually. If you've got a... Uh, we've lost it again. If you've got a front-wheel drive vehicle and you can't get the grip, one of the easiest ways of getting grip, if you can't be bothered to, lo to lower your tyre pressures, is to put some weight over the drive axle. I'm not sure how many people... We could give it to some students, I suppose, this. How many people could get sitting on the front bonnet of a Fiat Ducato? If it's rear wheel drive, how many can you get in the back? Loads. Can we have the screen back up again, please? Not there. Not there. Not there. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Might not be able to have the screen coming up then. Let's see. Anybody uh, good on IT here? I'll take that as a resounding no. <laughs> This will be the next part. This comes a bit later. Do we have electronics on vehicles? Oh, I'll talk quicker then. Sorry? We have to wait for Matt. Looks like we're all going to have to wait for Matt. <laughs> what we could do, though, at this point, instead of me standing up here talking, although we haven't got far into it, we could discuss any points if anybody's got any questions. What, the, what we're going to go through eventually, when this works, is we look at the different ways of building bodies. So we're going to assume that you've got a 4 before, or you got a chassis cab and you want to build your own box body. We'll be going through that. Then we'll be going through the different ways that you can provide power, what you need for your water system, the different options you've got for heating, 
and we will also be cut, touching on something which may be of interest to some people and other people will think it's of no interest or concern to them at all, is that area so often thought of as black magic of the Torsion Free Mount. Does anybody know what a Torsion Free Mount is? Yeah. So you probably know that there's been massive discussions on forums about the best way to do it, this, that and the other. A torsion free mount is used to isolate twisting forces of a chassis from the, the living box. Apologies. Sorry. Right. Can you press this on in particular? It's back to the right, which one are we at? Right, it's gone right back to the beginning, so do you know where you are? No. Not sure. Okay. This will happen while you're building your motor on as well, things will go wrong. Final day until you turn that job. <laughs> That's usually the case. <laughs> right, how far have you got? Keep going. Right, there we go then. Right, 4B2, yeah, next one. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay, we'll just go flicking through a few typical panel van variants which you can use. Something where you want to dip, it, dip in a little bit uh, deeper into your pocket. Now, the bigger 4B4s, this might be a concern for some people, it might not be. They're usually more than 7.5 tonnes, so you're going to need what's used to be called a heavy goods driver's licence. Yep. Yeah. That might not be a problem for some people, other people it could be a problem. Me personally, yeah? That's very true. You will, you don't need to see if, unless you want to tow a trailer. Good point. Um, but, but it does say it at the bottom. <laughs> Read it all. <laughs> but you also have to do, after I think the age of 45, you have to do medical. And I think when you're at 65, you've got to do it every year then. So if you're doing it later on in life, you might want to think about keeping it under 7.5 tonnes. If you want to keep something under 7.5 tonnes, it's got to be a little bit lighter. You can downplate. Downplating, all, all heavy goods vehicles are given a plated maximum weight. If it's got a plated weight of less than 12 tonnes, it's a paper exercise to downplate it to 7.5. If it's more than that, there will have to be some technical changes. And that could be, like there, it could be changes to the suspension, the wheels, the tyres, the brakes, or a mix of those. So the one that I've got, which is for sale, is plated at 13.5 tonnes. You can't downplate it to 7.5. Well, you can, but you won't get much on the back of it either in the real world. But there are some here which are... I think they're plated at 10 tonnes. There's a couple of Mercedes which are plated at 10 tonnes. You could downplate those to 7.5 and, and you just drive them on your old car licence. Uh, of course, who's going to be bothered when you're in the middle of the desert? But It's changing on here. <laughs> Right. Those are, that one's definitely of seven and a half, that would have started at seven and a half. So you get an idea of the size you can get for seven and a half tonnes. That's one of the Mercs, I'm not sure whether that, you, you get them at different weights, but they look very similar. But you'd have to go for the 1017 if you wanted to be able to downplate it to seven and a half. That's definitely going to hit category C. But I'm having a bit of fun. I don't know what he does with that, but it'd be fun trying, won't it? And some of us probably have towed at some time or other. If you really fancy towing, let's go for one of those, eh? It's going to be under seven and a half tonnes. I don't know how you get into it, but... Yeah. Right, 
on my own personal level, that's what I've just bought. That's uh, a Magavas Deutz with a Nivico badge on it. As it stands there, it's probably tipping the scales at just over six tonnes. That's lighter than the DAF equivalent, and it's probably lighter than the Merck and the MAN equivalent, but that's got an air-cooled engine on, and that's my next project. So I've done all this research, which I'm going to give you this afternoon, to build a box on the back of that. So I don't know if you can see on there, but that part there, and these two here, those are the torsion-free mounts. Very simple torsion-free mount, which we'll come on to later. Right, anybody who is going to go a long way, you're going to have to think about spares. Don't worry about it too much. Because just about every diesel engine which is in a truck now is also somewhere else in the world. And if it's not in a truck, it's in a generator or a piece of plant. Mercedes are a big maker of vehicles. Um, Mercedes make engines, Cummins make engines. Cummins engines go under the name Cummins, but they're also in Leyland DAFs, DAFs, Ivacos. The Ivaco Tecta engine is a Cummins B series, which is exactly the same as what's in modern day DAFs, which is exactly the same as what's in mine, which is exactly the same as what's in the, the DAF army trucks. They're all exactly the same. The six pot diesels, you'll get space for them absolutely anywhere. I think they are, yeah, I think you're right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. they're, they're everywhere, aren't they? Uh, they're in plants, they're in generators, packs, they're all over the place. You won't have problems getting spares for a truck engine. And if you use one of the well-known gearboxes, these EZFs, they hardly ever go wrong, You'd, so you don't need spares. But you will need to take the essentials. Drive belts, the, the peanuts fuel and oil filters, maybe some injector pipes, because unless you've got the equipment to make a pipe, you might want to carry a set of spare pipes from between the high pressure pump and your injectors. But anything else, somebody will be able to make up. Oh yeah, and don't forget your tools to fit it. It would be great having all the spares there. And think, oh right, uh, I've left my spanner. Right, down to the nitty gritty. We've done, we've done the vehicle, you've picked the vehicle, you know exactly what you want. You've bought it, like I have. What are you going to do? Size matters. It does. Right, full-timers. We're all familiar with the phrase of full-timers. Full-timers do it in absolutely any vehicle. There's, uh, I know there's a speech later on this afternoon, I think it is, by a couple who have been in a Mercedes for the last 12 years or so, travelling around the world. Those are the people you talk to. Before you actually build your body or do too, go too, too far down the line, talk to people who've done it. Talk to people who've lived in them. A chap who came up and parked up next to me last night, he's got a rear entrance one on the back of a DAF. You don't see many rear entrances, but it works for him. He built the layout he wanted. It doesn't have to be massive. It only has to be big enough for you. If you like a lot of space, you probably have to go for something daft size upwards. If you're not too worried about the space, you can get it on the little VW LTs or maybe even on a Sprinter 4 before. It's entirely up to you. How much space do you think you need? There's a couple of uh, websites there which are really worthwhile going on to. Um, the first one, as it suggests, that's for full-time motorhomers, motorhoming 365 days a year. And I'm not really sure what motorhome life is. I don't know if they've been sent to prison or something in a motorhome, but you know. Um, Mike and Ali Kingston, they've got uh, their full timing in a panel van, and I think they're on the first website. They're full timing in something about the size of a transit van. Maybe a little bit bigger than that. Different approaches. With your Land Rovers, you're probably going to have to have a pop top. But if you're going a little bit bigger, you might, and this is just purely personal for me, I want to be able to stand up without having to push a roof up. Some people might not be so needy of that, but will you really be that comfortable crouching over and walking up and down your van? It's up to you. It's your choice. It's your van. It's what you do. But there are different ways of doing pop tops. Canvas side 
which will do the job. Might be a little bit chilly at certain times of the year. Or I think that's a Unicat down at the bottom right hand corner where it goes up on rams and it nicely keeps all the windows secure as well. But it's not going to be light or cheap. Right, width is less important than height, for me. Oh, oh right, okay, <laughs> I've got to move. Uh, <laughs> the width is less important than height. If you can walk around in it, you're going to be comfortable. But if it's not that wide, you can't sleep across the vehicle. Then you have to sleep along the vehicle. It's entirely up to you which you do. But that will limit your internal layout. So we'll come on to a few internal layouts. But on the bottom part, the 4x4 truck means that if you're going to stand up inside it, it's going to be about 3.5 metres high. And it's about 2.2 metres wide. So it's a bit wider than your, your average panel van. Those are pretty much minimum dimensions. Just go through those again. Irrespective of which way you're looking at, the box on the back that you're going to be living in, you're really your minimum usable size from what investigations I've done is really about five metres. So that's going to put your overall length at about seven and a half. Suits me, might not suit you. I know there are some people out here who have got them on uh, the little VW MANs, which are a little bit shorter. But it's very much a case of what suits you. Different layouts give you different options. Fairly standard sort of motorhome layout that you could get from Swift or anybody else. But with a permanent double bed at the back, it's so much easier. I don't know how many of you have been caravanning up to do the usual shuffling the cushions around. It can get a bit of a pain after two weeks. Think what it's like after 50 weeks. You're not going to be wanting to do it. Or I'm not, anyway. Some people are possibly more patient than me. There's a little dinky one, somebody's drawn that one up. He's got the kitchen at the front and he's got a dinette at the back. I think on the other side must be the loo. But all this is showing you is that there's, there's no right or wrong. It's what suits you, what fits your vehicle, what you need. Right, if you're thinking of a panel van, I would suggest that you go to one of the various van hire places, Salford van hire or whatever, hire one and sling a mattress in the back in a camping stove and go and play in it. Don't tell them. Then you'll soon find out if you can live in a panel van. If you can't live in a panel van, the best thing, the best bit of advice I was given, and I would stand by this, is make up a dummy room of about the size of the box that you can possibly live in. See if you can. It can, it can be in your garage, in, in your, any spare room, wherever you want to do it. And just do the same and see if you can be comfortable in that space. So up here, yeah, put, your, put many walls up and see if you can live in that area. Try living in it. If you can't, you either change things around in it or you have to get something a bit bigger. It's entirely up to you which way you go, but it's a lot better to be shifting around little boxes than buying the box, building it, and finding out that you got the wrong one. DIY, build it yourself. Bimobile won't like you, Unicat won't like you, but I haven't got 80, 90, 100,000 pounds to spare on one. Don't know who else has. The advantage of that is you will get exactly what you want. You'll have, what, you'll have your fridge in the right spot, you'll have your cooker in the right spot. There's always going to be a compromise, it's not going to be perfect, but you'll have it pretty damn close. And you'll have it at an okay price. Same for converting a panel van. Converting panel vans by Swift or any of the motorhome makers is always more costly than building a coach built body because you've got to trim all the, the furniture to the profiles of the van sides. It takes a lot of time. Right, now we're down to the nitty gritty. This is where it starts getting interesting, hopefully. The blue cab, I think that one might be here actually this weekend. He's got a steel framed body. Absolutely nothing wrong with a steel framed body. It's cost effective. You can do it yourself if you can weld or if you've got somebody who can weld. <laughs> and that one is the old fashioned traditional timber coach built body, which is possibly not quite such a good idea because it hasn't got the, the rigidity that a welded body will have. 
The time consuming to build, they can be heavy, but they're easy for the DIY to build. Sandwich construction, used in caravans, used in buildings, used in heavy goods vehicles a lot. There are companies out there who will make those panels up to your specification. That's probably going to be a dry freight body by the look of it. Maybe refrigerated, maybe ambience, but it doesn't really matter. But the principle is the same. You have an outer skin, an inner skin, insulation inside. I had the misfortune, well now I consider it misfortune, at the time it seemed all right, to own a swift caravan once and it leaked. And to get it fixed, what the, how they build them, if you've ever seen how they build caravans, they start at the chassis, to put the floor down, then they build all the bed boxes and the kitchen units and everything else, then they put the sides on and they screw the sides to the furniture. But to keep weight down, all they had behind that plywood inner face of that wall were little sheets of steel about that size and you relied on self-tappers going into them. It worked for a caravan, possibly not a good option for something as rugged as this, but that's where you can design in timber battening so that you can screw into wood. You will get somebody who will build it for you then you send it off to a body assembler and he makes a box for you. Don't try making them yourself because they the need to be either in vacuums or they need to be very high pressure presses on them. Those are the advantages. You can put the openings exactly where you want them in the side of a, side of a box. You can build feminine into your furniture and they should be just what you want if you've done your homework first. Disadvantages. They are difficult to repair you won't be able to do a DIY job on it. And if you haven't kept a drawing of your side or your end panel, the person who's doing the, re the repair will find it difficult. So very, very important, if you design it yourself, keep your drawings, keep your specs yourself. If damp gets in, it's, you really are probably realistically looking at a brand new panel. But just about all your heavy goods bodies are using those and you'll probably see on I mean I can just see the roof of a motorhome there he's got pretty big cappings probably from like three or four inches down the side and across the top you can get a hell of a lot of mastic in there and it will keep it out here we go torsion free mounts I don't know how many people are going to actually go to that extreme with an off-road vehicle when they've got the house on the back but that shows what happens if that body was rigidly mounted to the chassis, it would twist and you would leak. There you go, you can see the chassis twist in there. The on the sketch down in the bottom right hand corner, that's the Unimog setup. Very isolates all torsional forces, but might be a little bit over engineered for what most of us would need. The purpose of it is to isolate the twist from the chassis. Come on. Now, there's been a lot of talk about, uh, I'll just go back to that one. There's been a lot of talk about, uh, on forums, about torsion free mounts. And some people have got into the real fine engineering of them. Basically what you do, is you imagine a ladder, and if you try and twist it like that, there are two neutral points. One is halfway between the chassis rails running along, and the other one is at some point between the front and the back. It's not necessarily halfway, but the chassis designer will know where that neutral point is. If you think of an ordinary tipper truck, it's got a hinge at the back, and it lifts at the front. That chassis can twist away underneath that, but the tipper body never falls off. Turn it round the other way, which is what's happening on mine. So you've got your hinge at the front of your body, somewhere behind the cab. For that not to damage, that would have to be at the neutral point between front and back. That's usually about... Just let's click back. If we look at this one, your neutral point is going to be somewhere about there. It will be. It's just the way that the science works but you'll have to find it. Obviously the one going down is halfway between each chassis rail. 
And if you remember the one that I've got, it's got the pivot at the back and then it's got some a little bit further forward. I've already got them on. So Ivico or Magivus, whoever designed it and built it, they've already worked that out for me. I've got my three point mount, all I've got to do is sit my body on it. You will find an engineer out there who will work it out or you can go to the chassis maker and they will tell you where it is. A lot of other people have been talking about how much a body rolls when it's on the back of a truck like that. Of course it does. It's not a Ferrari, is it? It's not an MG midget. It's a 4 before 4 truck. You're miles up off the ground. You don't need an engineering solution to stop body rolling. <laughs> you slow down. <laughs> if, if you're going to fall over in a corner, you're going too fast, aren't you? The easiest way to stop the body roll, you can do it with some springs. Other people talk of massive shock absorbers and everything else. Just slow down. One of the easiest ways, if you've got the, if you've got the hinge at the back, like on a tipper truck, and you're just having the hinge there and you're leaving it floating at the front, have two fairly large metal plates fastened to your camper body and two fairly large metal plates fastened to the chassis and just get them to slide along to each other. And they won't go that way. They will just hold it longitudinally in the right spot, but it'll allow it to, the chassis to move underneath it. There's very, very easy, simple solutions to it. We could, go, we could talk about that for a, for a weekend. We go through all the engineering. But there's a lot on websites. There's a lot of guff on the websites, to be fair. But if you talk to the uh, bodybuilders, Wilcox do a lot of tipper bodies. They can sort you out. They can explain it all to you. Right, services. This is a bit which makes it comfortable. You're going to need electricity. You're going to need water. You're probably going to need a loo and a shower. You'll need to have some heating and ventilation, and you'll need some storage. Electricity, it's easy, it is. It's not that difficult. If you can wire a plug, if you can connect your hi-fi system up, if you can get your smart telly to work, you can wire up a motorhome. I, I can't get my smart telly to work properly, so maybe I shouldn't be doing this. It's dead easy. You have got two sources of power. One will be external, Okay, maybe three. If you count the external, the external will be either 240 volts or the solar panels. The one on the vehicle is the vehicle alternator. Mine's 24 volts, Land Rovers I think still 12 volts, are they Land Rovers? Yeah. That's going to pretty well determine what you do. I could run 12 volt electrics in my body, but what's the point? I've got 24 volts being kicked out from the engine. So I'm running 24 volts, although, I found a tip out last night that the purely electrically operated fridges, if you run them at 12 volts through a dropper from a 24 volt source, the 24 volt batteries last longer. I'm going to have to experiment with that and I'll come back to you. The easiest way is to use what the vehicle uses, 24 volts or 12. We all, we've all used mains, haven't we, at some time or other. The one downside with 24 volt power systems in a living fox is that a mains to 24 volt battery charger will cost you more than a mains to, 24 volt, uh, to 12 volt, purely and simply because of the scale of production. All caravans, the vast majority of motorhomes, they're all 12 volts, they've got loads that can sell worldwide. There's not many going to 24 volts, they're a little bit more specialist. Um, electricity, providing it is one thing. But down at the bottom, you've got to think about your total consumption and work backwards from that. That's where people do start getting a little bit worried. Because what is your electricity consumption? It, it is affected by heating, it is affected by your, your plumbing system, it's affected by everything. So we'll look at heating. You're going to need it. Those are basically your different forms. Heating can be blown air, water, gas, diesel, or it could be a wet system. The Eberspacher system can work on a wet system where you can have either the heater matrix and this is what you have behind the dashboard in your cab, or you can have radiators. Tabert caravans use an older system which is similar to an Eberspacher, but they use mini radiators and they are very effective. But it's up to you. Do you want water running around? Entirely up to you. Now, one thing which I've got, I've got the heater matrixes with the fans. Those fans take a heck of a lot of current. 
that was one thing that I got wrong on mine. So the blown air systems and the wet systems where you got the, the matrix, think you've got to have a circulation pump, you've got to have electricity for the programmer on the Eberschbacher unit, and you've got to have electricity for the fans. If you use just radiators, you haven't got the fans. You're drawing less current. You can get away with fewer or smaller batteries, all makes it a little bit more efficient. Water. Water is heavy. It is. It's about one kilogram a litre. I carry 200 litres on mine, so that's 200 kilograms, a fifth of a tonne. It's a lot of stuff to carry around. So, bear in mind your gross vehicle weight. If you're looking at downplating a 10 tonner to a 7.5 tonner, you're probably not going to be able to carry a quarter of a tonne of water. You will, more than likely, because we're all adventurers and we're all sort of daring souls, aren't we? You'll probably want to frost proof your tanks. Very easy, very easy, exactly the same as what you do in your house. You can use the same stuff from B&Q or Wix or anything like that. Maybe a slightly longer tape on it. That's all you do, you wrap it in an insulation blanket. But also do your pipes. That's your pipes into your body, up to your taps and everything else, and your drain points. Because if they freeze, you can't get rid of it. One thing which I did on mine, We've all heard of CAK tanks, haven't we? They make off-the-peg tanks and they make custom tanks. I went for off-the-peg. What I would recommend is get them to make a custom tank for you. If an off-the-peg tank isn't actually exactly what you want, spend that little bit more and get a custom-made tank. I'm a bit of a softy. I, I like having a loo and a shower in mine. Some of you might be like really uh, hardcore and... Uh, think oh, they're for wimps but oh, it's, it's, it's great when you're doing out hiking cycling or whatever and you come back in you can just have a shower and be human again but they take up space caravan type blue will be fine because they're lightweight they really are lightweight compared with the other options if you go to a boat builder you can get a porcelain bowl which I've got in mine but compared with the porta potty equivalent it weighs a ton and remember, weight's a problem. Shower, yeah, built in, multiple space, whatever you like. But there are external showers on the market. So you don't necessarily have to have it inside, you can do it outside. There's loads of stuff out there. Do you want a roof hatch? Seen, seen all the Land Rovers with the roof tents? They do quite appeal to me, actually, for sleeping in on a, on a night at times. So. Go down to your local boat builder and they have all these hatches for getting in and out of boats, obviously. And it'll come a heck of a lot cheaper than the equivalent one. Correction. It'll come back better value for money than the equivalent one from a caravan maker because it's much better built. Secure a strong door for your living space and secure doors for everything else. Everything out of sight for me. It could be a bit tricky on some of the 4 fours because if you're boxing something in, that adds weight. Right, okie dokes then. So, we're all pretty well convinced that we can build our own now, are we? That uh, we're not going to go and pay, pay buy more bills prices, we're going to do it ourselves. There you go, that's all you need. Time. Oh, pencils and paper. And then more time. Then, you need a computer. Not because you're going to do a CAD drawing, although you might be able to do a CAD drawing, I can't. But you'll use it for research. I've only given you two websites there, but there are loads and loads of websites out there which you would really, really benefit from going and looking at. There's about buildings, there's about living in them, there's all kinds of things. Oh, time crops up again. Yeah, because all that research is going to take you a hell of a lot of time. Patience and time. You're getting the idea that this is not going to be a quick job. If you're thinking of going off and, uh, from this show and setting off on a mammoth journey in about April, yeah, you've left it too late, you're not going to. Because as you do all that research and you find that there's this way you're doing it, that way you're doing it, and that way you're doing it, you will get confused. Go back to the basics. What's right for you? I'm just going to pick on this gentleman here just because you corrected me earlier on. <laughs> Those are really nice boots. What, what size are they? 
Oh, they're no bloody good to me. They suit you, but they're no use to me. I like them, but they're no use to me. It's just like buying a pair of shoes, which will... I'm not going to be sexist. Yes, I am. I'm going to be ever so slightly sexist. The women in the audience will know exactly what we mean. It's about buying a pair of shoes. They've got to fit. It's got to fit you. You've got to fit it. You've got to be comfortable. That's where the time plays a part. I mean, how long do you take to pick a pair of shoes? <laughs> yeah. 20 minutes, 20 minutes to pick a pair of shoes. I can see why you're with her. <laughs> yeah, how long did it take you to pick your boots? So you were giving them then? Yeah, you got one for your right foot, one for your left foot, and one was roughly about size. Yeah. But <laughs> you can see the time. You've got to spend the time doing your research. You will have a mountain of information. And then, actually, when you actually start around to getting on the rebuilding it, three quarters of that is going to go. And that isn't because it's useless. It was useful. It's just that you discounted it because it didn't suit you. And that, the, the, the one next to bottom is probably the best one. Just relax. You don't have to build it to suit me. I'm not going to come around and inspect it and say, oh, yeah, well, you should have done this, you should have done that, you should have done the other. In exactly the same way that none of you are going to come to mine and say, oh, well, you should have done it this way, that way, the other way. I built mine to... Where are you parked? <laughs> I'm parked next to the one alongside me. <laughs> that's the one, that's the one. Yeah. Materials. Again, there isn't a right or a wrong. I've done mine in plywood. Believe me, plywood does twist. It's not perfectly flat. So you might want to go for thinner plywood on a lightweight timber frame. Caravan manufacturers do it. As long as it's assembled correctly, they are amazingly strong and light. MDF, same as above. I'm not sure if MDF does twist, but it can absorb moisture. Yeah, it lots of yeah. Screws yeah. Composite panels. Excellent notion. You can get composite panels which are about five or six mil thick and they will be very strong, they'll be very light and they'll be great for doors and panels but they might be expensive compared with the more traditional materials but they'll be fantastically strong and immensely light so if weight is a consideration really bear that in mind I've got a whole list of people who can provide these at the end there'll be my contact details and anybody who wants the bibliography or any contact details of companies, just drop us an email. All materials have advantages and disadvantages. Yeah, I don't really know why I told you to look at caravans there, other than you can see how well they do things which are light and strong. Motor caravans are pretty much the same, but I think actually the most rugged would be boat furniture. Because they're in very, very similar environments to those that we might find ourselves in, okay, they're generally wet hopefully, um, but we might be wet. They're going to stay in boats for quite a long time, a lot of people. We're going to stay in our vehicles for quite a long time. Most caravans use, what, two weeks of a year and then maybe the odd weekend. They don't have to be quite as rugged. Where I live, up in East Yorkshire, we've got a mobile optician. And when he first came to the village I live in, he had a, a Daihatsu 4-track and a little twin-axle trailer, which was just basically a box. He then went and bought a Damon Daybreak RV from Travel World, I think it is, Wolverhampton, something like that anyway. Big American motorhome. It had a slide out, had self-leveling jacks, full works. He regretted buying that because, in the same way that caravans, it was designed to go onto an RV park, drop the jacks, it's used three or four times a year. He was using it eight eight or nine times a week, something like that, he wore it out. He's now running a Mercedes Atigo with a purpose-built body on the back. So, just, that's something you will have to have regard to, that caravans are not fantastically rugged, and I hope there's nobody here who's from all the American RVs further over in the field. They're not fantastically rugged if you're using them every day. So I don't know what happens with that six-wheeler that we showed you earlier. Fixings. 
fixings are the thing which will make or break your project. Use the best you can afford. Boat builders will be your best friend. Stainless steel fittings, fixings, screws, bolts, etc. are great. But if you're in a very high tensile environment at some point, you don't want to use a stainless steel bolt because they're much more brittle than ordinary high tensile steel. And I've noticed this gentleman there nodding. He's probably been in the same situation as me at some time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. But bolt builders, they're always using these special types of fittings, or what we might consider to be special types of fittings, because of the environment they work in. Brass is very, very good. They use brass a lot on boats. Um, and there's nobody here who works for B&Q, is there? Well, never mind. There's nothing personal against B&Q. It's just that it will charge you stupid money for a box of screws. Whereas, if we're all fans of the two Ronnies, you go down to the place where you can get four candles. If you go there, the guy behind the counter, unlike in the two Ronnies, knows exactly what you're talking about. Or, if you're going in there and say, well, I want a so-and-so, so-and-so that does this, he will have something in his warehouse which does it. He knows absolutely everything there is to know about screws, nuts, bolts, washers, etc. It's a life and soul of a party. Yep, you're going to need some tools. Don't buy cheap ones. Don't buy cheap ones. Please do not buy cheap tools. Two things which I found very, very useful was a pillar drill and a mitre saw. Purely and simply because at some time or other, your pillar drill can be used as a mortising toil. And I'm not advocating that you do this because of all health and safety and legislation and people may have my name at the end of this. You can also use it as a router if you don't want to go and buy yourself a handheld router. But I'm not advocating that you do that. You can do, but you've got to be careful. The mitre saw, it just makes life so much easier. You know, you've you got this, you've got a piece of wood that you have to cut, so you know, done. You, know, you could spend a lot, lot longer with a tenon saw. Yeah, now the top one, yeah, I think that's probably the only thing that I really, really would say that's what you've got to do. Get yourself some battery powered tools. I tripped over an extension lead just about coming out of my motorhome while I was building it. And I nearly went completely out of it. And it's well, about so high. And I didn't have the steps then either. And I was going out of it, tripped over the lead and managed to catch myself and uh, stop myself falling to my death. Well, all right, slight exaggeration. I might have hurt myself a bit. So if you've got battery tools, you haven't got the extension lead. But make sure you've got enough batteries. Because if you're drilling away, and you can use it as a screwdriver, as you all know, and you're halfway through a job and your battery runs out, you want another one just to click in. So have two or three batteries. Drills and screwdrivers, yeah, power drills and power screwdrivers. I know we're all a bunch of wimps now, aren't we? You know, but they do make life a lot easier. A power, power screwdriver is in in no time, isn't it? And most of them have got torque loading, so you won't overscrew it. Like I said, power leads can be lethal. There you go, that's me, aj.48 at live.com. I've got a bibliography, and that's my mobile. And as the gentleman said, my truck's out there with the full sale sign in front of it. You can come round, you can have a look at it. Have a look at all of them. I was wandering around amongst all the big 4x4s, and I noticed that some of them, they've got the plastic windows or the acrylic windows, similar to what you have in caravans. The one next door to me, all of his are scratched. Some of these have put rectangular section, aluminium box section through, around them, and aluminium flaps, which can be lifted up. I thought, that's a brilliant idea. So, even though I've been standing up here and you've been all very polite listening to me, I don't know everything. I'm learning, I've built one, I'm going to be building another one. All I would say to you is, you can do it. Break it down into little stages. I haven't given you a blow-by-blow -blow account, but a very typical example is 
when you're designing the electrical circuit, don't design it from the batteries. Design it from the lights, the heater, the fridge, design it back to your batteries. And put in the thickest, heaviest cable you can because there's less voltage drop. Any questions? Any queries? Any ideas? Yeah? I've got an idea. You know you said about going to boat builders, caravan breakers, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, 